going to be an awesome conference we're looking forward to it and, and it really is it's all about and, and, and Luke came up with that and you know what it really ain't about how hard you can hit it's about how hard you can be hit and still stay on your feet amen I tell you man the first time he showed that to me we we're at Starbucks go figure right <laughs> and uh man we're sitting there having coffee if you've ever had coffee with me especially recently man it doesn't take much to, to bring me to tears anyway so we're sitting there having coffee next thing i know man i'm in tears that thing just but truth of the matter is this giant killers is going to be an awesome one i want to encourage every one of our men to be here every one of our men to invite a man that needs to be here bring a young man this isn't just for men i call it a men's conference it's for the young men of the church as well so if you've got a son you need to bring him if you've got a nephew that nobody's fathering you should bring him if you've got a neighbor that's you you know you guys have been close and you guys built a relationship and he doesn't have a dad maybe or his dad's not active in his life get him to giant killers it's going to be an awesome awesome time so i want to encourage every every man here make that a priority in your life okay because it's going to be a great time for all of us and for the church all right with that i'm going to dig into god's word it has been awesome since um, I've been preaching a little bit about that, that Jesus alone theory. You know, I talked about having dinner with, with misfits. And, and, and in that, I kind of started on, on a trek that I knew I was heading on on doing a little bit of Jesus, 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 Jesus business before we got into Easter. Because it's, it's important that we get, some, you know, sometimes we can be all over in our teaching of the Bible. And, and myself, but you know, and not only other pastors, myself, I love to teach. And, you know, I've taught on Jacob this year I've taught about Abraham a little bit this year we've been all over taught on David but but for this little season before Easter starting back at the, the, the when I talked about having going to dinner with misfits I really believe God's led us to stick with that Jesus alone theory I even encourage you in one of the messages to read the red letters of Jesus because those are some important words for all of us to be digging into so with that in mind you know I spoke spoke a while back on on going to dinner with misfits and that was Jesus taking some misfits to dinner and I then we talked about um the the Jesus alone and then we had guest speaker in between those and we've been doing that some and that gives me a little bit of a break and helps me to heal up and preach with a little bit more of a full cup that way and then um after that we had Pastor Lee and we celebrated with him last week so now this week the title of my message and here again straight from the red letters um, the title's not straight from the red letters, but our message is, let's pray. Now, a lot of times when you come to church, the first thing you'll hear the pastor say when he gets up before he even starts his intro and all that stuff is, let's pray. You know, I'm going to teach today some of probably the, the, the most popular verses in the Bible, some verses that, that people all around know about. They've heard about, they've read, possibly, possibly, and I don't know for sure. Possibly the most memorized passage of scripture. At least I would think so. And matter of fact, once I begin to read it, most of you could probably begin to say it with me. Okay? So I'm going to start out in my old school red letter edition. And I'm going to read you a little bit of a text. And then I'm going to read you my main text. Okay? Um, and the story starts out here. And I'm going to be teaching from Luke 11 and Matthew chapter 6 title of today's message is let's pray okay Luke chapter 11 verse 1 one day Jesus was praying in a certain place when he had finished one of his disciples said to him teacher teach us to pray just as John's disciples were taught to pray and he said to them when you pray pray like this and the rest of you can probably go along with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever. Amen? See what I, you guys joined right in? I even asked you. You know, but we can say it, but can we pray it? That's my, my question is, you can say it, but can you pray it? I mean, can you take time with the Lord and really pray those principles? He was teaching them something. He wasn't just teaching them to recite something. He was teaching them something. Prayer is not just reciting that verse or section of verses or passage of verses, but it's pray like this. When you pray, pray like this. So in this today, and, and truth of the matter is, it kind of ends off with a story here in Luke that he talked about um, um, when, when, when you really want something, it goes into a story about a neighbor, had a guest show up in the middle of the night, go knock on the guy's door. And he said, the guy won't answer the door in the middle of the night because you're his friend or because you're his neighbor. But the, it actually says in Luke chapter 11, verse 8 and 9 at the end of the story, that he'll get up and answer the door and give you what you want because of your persistence or shameless audacity or boldness, he will rise and give you whatever it is that you're asking for. And then the Lord said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be given to you. And then he repeats the principle, but ask, seek, and knock. And then he repeats the principle, everybody who asks will receive. Everybody who seeks will find. Everybody who knocks, the door will be open to him. Hey, listen. What was, he, what was the principle? Why did the guy get his prayer answered? Because of his boldness. Because of his shameless audacity. Because of his persistence. And folks, in prayer, let me tell you, this isn't something when we talk about prayer that is just like, hey, I'm going to pray it once a week when I go to church on Sundays. It isn't a prayer, I'm going to pray this prayer, I'm going to recite this prayer every morning before I get up. I'm not going to pray this prayer at the beginning of the meeting or the end of the meeting because it's going to make the meeting holy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He said, I want you to pray like this. And then he gave examples of someone that needed something and how they were shamelessly audacity. Their audacity was like, you're kidding me. This guy is still not. Have you ever had someone do that? I'm going to tell you this, man. Middle of the night, you come knocking on my door. Anybody know? That's probably not a wise thing to do for somebody. How many, how many like someone come knocking on your door in the middle of the night? I mean, errors, I, I, I'm thinking that where this place was, it, well, I guess they didn't have guns then, so it wasn't a right to carry state. <laughs> but man, I know Peter carried a knife, carried a sword. But because of this guy's shameless audacity, because of his boldness, because of his persistence, the dude got up and got what he needed. And Jesus was using this as an example for us of prayer, okay? Let me do this. I'm going to change over to you. Now, I told you the same story is told in Matthew chapter 6, Luke chapter 11, okay? I'm going to switch over to the Message Bible and read this in a way that you won't be able to read it back with me because you won't, unless you've mes memorized it in the message, it's much different. Same principles. But truth of the matter is, Jesus was wanting, because truth of the matter is, the way Jesus said it, do you know Jesus didn't say it the same way we just all recited it together? Is everybody aware of that? He said in a totally different language. He said it in Hebrew. So the, the way we say our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hey, it, the exact words weren't what it was all about. It was about pray like this. Here we go. Let's go with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from the message translation. And I'm just going to read you a, a good 10 verses from Matthew now. I just read you about 10 verses from Luke. Chapter 6, verse 5 through 15. Here we go. Starting at verse 5. When you come before God, don't turn it into a theatrical production all these people making regular show of their prayers, hoping for some stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what he wants you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place where you won't be tempted to role play before God. 
and just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. Are you hearing this? Are you getting that? See, he just wants you to come find you a place where you, there ain't nobody else going to be watching what's going on. Find you a private place, a secret place, if I may, where you can just be as undressed and honest before God. Hair's all messed up. You can have bed head before God, right? Hey, listen, there's a lot of folks you don't want to be, you know, you, you get up, the first thing you do maybe is get your hair and makeup on because you don't want anybody to see you. You can have, you need to find a place where you don't even worry about hair and makeup, where you don't worry about what your clothes look like or whether they've been ironed or not, whether you got lint on your black shirt. Not that I would worry about that or something. I think I just told on myself. <laughs> or makeup on your collar. Here we go. Here's what I want you to do. Find that quiet place, secluded place where you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there. As simply and honestly as you can manage. I like that as you can manage. Because how many know, sometimes it takes a while to get simple and honest before God. Everybody understand what I'm saying? And, and as you grow in God, you're going to realize, I've learned to get more honest with him, more transparent with him. I've become a lot simpler before God. And he said this, the focus will then shift from you to God. And you will begin to sense his grace. He said, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who pray arrogant prayers. They're full of formulas, programs, and advice. Peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. I'm going to tell you this. It's very true what he just said. Don't fall into those nonsense traps. This is your father you're dealing with. He knows better. Than you, than you, what you even need. With a God this loving to you, you can pray very simply like this. Now you're going to hear it a little different than we all recited it together. He says in the message, our Father in heaven, reveal yourself to us. Set the world right. Do what's best above and below. Keep us alive with three square meals a day. Give us forgiveness as we're forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze and a beauty. Yes, yes, yes. In prayer, there's a connection between what God does and what you do, you can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without giving forgiveness. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. So here we go. Some simple things from the passages that I've read to you from Luke chapter 11, Matthew chapter 6. Because really and truthfully, when I say let's pray, that's what Jesus was saying. He's, he's like, he don't want you to just, re don't, don't memorize what I'm saying, guys. Gal, and, and now I'm saying to gals too, because we got, it was, he had basically his 12 disciples there that he was talking to. He said, let's pray. I want to teach you. You saw me praying. You want to know what was going on. You want to pray like I pray. That's what they were saying. He was in a certain place and he would been praying. When he was done praying, they came to him and said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Just like John's taught his disciples to pray. We want to pray like we want to connect with God, like you're connecting with God. And you know, I know I've taught this message on a Thursday night in this church before, but I'm not hundred percent sure I've taught it on a Sunday morning. And I thought, man, what a shame if I haven't taught our full congregation this message to pray. Because let me tell you, this is a very important message. And it's not just a prayer to be recited. Although there are times when you could go down the road and you could begin to recite that. And as you're thinking of those words, you mean them with all of your heart. And man, God can begin to do things. But I want to teach you what he was saying as we look at the whole passage. Number one. He was saying, let's pray with a heart. I like this because apparently John probably had a process of teaching his disciples to pray. How many get that? And that's why Jesus' disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray like John's teaching his disciples to pray. 
You know what Jesus was waiting for? He was waiting for hunger. He was waiting for the heart. He didn't want to teach them to do something just because he told them to do it, that they would do it. He wanted them to have a heart to do it. And you know, my prayer as I was preparing this message was that the people at Big House would have a heart to pray, a heart to connect with God on a regular basis, that, that this would be a part of your daily life, that you connect with God, that it would be your heart. And you've got to check your heart when you go to God. That's what all of that hubbub before what I read was, was don't be like the rest of the world. You don't have to do it for show it ain't none of that it's all about you connecting with God and when you get before God simply and honestly then all of a sudden the focus is off of you and what you know and what you can say and it's on him and his incredibleness so the number one thing about prayer is your heart going to God with a heart that is pure and saying God I just want to be with you I want to hang out with you I want to spend time with you my heart yearns for you. Does that make sense to everybody? When these disciples said, teach us to pray in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. That was the key Jesus was waiting for. Because to him, that was them going, our heart wants to pray. We want, don't just teach us because every, everybody else is learning. And, and don't just teach us as part of the process. But we want to learn. We've seen you. We want to learn what you, we want to pray like you're praying. It's a heart. So number one, pray with a heart. Number two, there's a time. Watch this. Luke chapter 11, verse 2. He said to them, when you pray. When is a specific time? When. Doesn't mean if you pray. When you pray. Folks, and I really believe this. There are times in your life you need to have a... How many have a scheduled time to know what time you're going to work tomorrow morning? Raise your hand. Just go ahead. It, this, uh, this isn't an embarrassing question. How many of you know you got to work tomorrow, but you're clueless on what time you're going? There's one. Okay, two, three. Most people know what time they're going to work. What am I saying? I think it helps us as human beings, as individuals, to have a time that we pray. When you pray. You should have a win when you're going to spend time with God. You should have a win sometime in your day on your schedule that is locked out for this. Is, that way, hey, you know what happens? If you, if you, let's just say, for instance, your prayer time is 7 a.m. to 8. You got to be to work at 9. Someone calls and says, hey, Garrett, let's do breakfast at 7 a.m. Garrett can go, let me look at my schedule. Oh, you know what? I'm booked 7 a.m. I got a more important appointment. You don't have to say more important, but we all know if your appointment is with God, it is more important. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. He's the most important appointment you can have on your calendar every single day. Maybe your appointments are more midday. Maybe you like to take your lunch time. Although I would recommend everybody start your day with some Jesus time. It may not be your full saturation time. How many understand what I'm saying? Because some people have kids to get ready for you've got to get yourself ready ladies especially guys you ought to spend some time more time getting yourself ready maybe <laughs> maybe you can't have full saturation time in the morning and I get that I understand that let me tell you when we planted this church I was co I was pastoring and working another full-time job and for 17 years I was full-time pastor and not working another job but when I was pastoring and working another job I realized some of the demands pastors would put on people to say, you got to get up and have a full saturation time of prayer before you get anything done in the morning. It may not always be possible or practical. You may have a better time. Your day may start with some words with God and with some invitations to God to help and direct you. But there may be another place in your day that you've got a little window of time or a bigger window of time where you can spend a longer period of time with God and get saturated. What you need in prayer is a saturation point. How many understand what I'm saying? You, you got to get in there long enough that you soften up before God so that you get to that place that this says here. Did you read what it says or did you listen? It says, the focus will shift from God to you. But that takes saturation. How many understand that? And so every morning you should spend some time with him. But I'm not saying that's going to be your only and maybe not even your most time in prayer. Because of some of your schedules. 
Sometimes it may be, hey, you know what? I just, I, I pack my lunch. And when I go on lunch, I eat with Jesus every, every day. And I spend an hour with God and I talk and I pray and I listen to worship music and I read, study my Bible. And maybe your lunch hour is your most intimate time with God. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Maybe it's at night. Maybe you're a housewife or a husband. And maybe when you get home, there's kids running around and baths to be had and, and meals to be made and, and all that stuff that goes on in families. And maybe your best saturation time with Jesus is after the dust of the day has settled. Now, does that mean he's not invited in the rest of the day? No, you definitely want him in those parts. But you need a time. Is everybody hearing what I'm saying? So you got to have the right heart to pray. you got to have a heart that says, I'm hungry for you, God. And that should be part of our prayer today. I'm hungry for you, God. You should have a time to pray. You should make time to pray. Number three, there's an attitude to pray. There's an attitude to prayer. Watch this. Now, I'm not saying have an attitude. But I guess I am saying have an attitude. Have the right attitude if you're going to have one, though, right? Luke 9 and I started with this verse, Luke 11, excuse me, 8 and 9. Because of your shameless audacity, your boldness, your persistence, there's the attitude right there. When you go to God, there should be, he's your heavenly father. And that's Jesus, he even reiterated that when I read that. This is your father you're dealing with. You're not trying to showboat. You're not trying to impress him. Let me tell you, he knows every wicked thought you think. He knows every filthy thought you think, greedy thought you think, and everything you do that nobody else sees, he sees it. This is your father speaking, that you're speaking to. But the cool thing about that is, is because he is your father, you can ask him what you need. You can be straight up, up front and know he, as long as he sees fit for you to have it, he's going to make sure and help you get it. And Jesus taught right after he said these famous words, our father who are in heaven, about being shamelessly, having shameless audacity, boldness, persistence in him. He said, everybody who asks will receive. Everybody who seeks will find. And everybody who knocks, it'll be open to him. Listen, folks, we should be asking we should be seeking and we should be knocking. And after you've asked and after you seek and after you knock, do you know what you do? You ask and you seek and you knock. I thought it was pretty cool. Ask is A-S-K, right? Ask, first letter's A. Seek, first letter's S. Knock, first letter's K. Goes right back to ask. Shamelessly persistent. You got to have an attitude that goes, hey, and remember this in your attitude, God's eternal. You're not yet. We will be, but we still live in this finite body that we're kind of trapped in your mind, our heart, our spirits are eternal. You're going to live on forever, right? But is, is that eternal time clock mindset throws our human stuff into like tailspins sometimes because God doesn't always answer everything in the time frame we think he should but the Bible says with God a thousand day a, a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years so time time's not a big deal to God how many understand what I'm saying and so we got to go with the idea of if he didn't ask and if he didn't answer what I asked this week I'm gonna ask again I'm gonna keep posing the question I'm going to talk to God about this thing and talk to God about this thing and talk to God about this thing till we come to an understanding and we have an answer. That's what he's saying. Come with an attitude of, I'm going to be persistent with God. I'm going to persistently pray. Because like, 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 like Jesus said when I was reading the message, you spend this time with God, what happens? God doesn't change when you spend time with him. Did you know that? Isn't it crazy? What was Jesus saying though? God's not going to change when you spend time with him. You're going to change when you spend time with him. And so the things that you've been asking for, sometimes those things become <clears throat> relatively pale or dim once you've been in the presence of God for a while. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
And so you may even change your prayers after being in the presence of God for a while. So number one is the heart. Number two is a time. Number three is a place. Number four is an attitude. And number five is an example. He gave us an example to pray. Now, I'm going to encourage every one of you, hopefully, even if you take notes on your iPhone, I don't care where you take notes, but man, this is important stuff. Luke chapter 11, or whatever kind of phone you have, a smartphone or a not smartphone, or if you got paper, take it on paper, that works real well, in the back of your Bible. But this example is a beautiful example of how we should be spending time before God. And I'm going to share that with us as a congregation right now. Jesus shared it, but I'm going to share it and, and, and I'm going to expound just a little bit on it. Not a whole lot, some. The example comes from, I'm using the message still, Matthew 6 through 18. And the example is some words that I've written down that go with the scriptures that he's given us. From verse 9, he said, our father, that is recognition. You need to recognize who God is. And let me just encourage you in this. As you are doing your scripture studies, not in your prayer time necessarily, but as you're studying scriptures, and when you find scriptures in the Bible that talk about who God is, write them down. And then as you come to this part of prayer, talk to God as if he's this, the, the, what you wrote down. Like, I've been reading, and we're going to do a series on God right after Easter. I am, you are. Where D David said, because you are God, I am. And because he is the I am, he says to us, you are. And he's our rock, he's our protection, he's our fortress, he's our provider. There's a million things in the Bible that he says he is. Matter of fact, you know what he is? He's everything we need. He's everything emotionally you need. He's everything physically you need. Everything financially, he's it. He is it. Every time Moses would come up with an objection why he should follow God, God's response was, I am. God can handle it. Okay? He is. So, recognition. Recognize. And in your initiating conversation, just like if you were writing a letter, you put the name of the person that you're addressing at the top of the letter, don't you? How about when you were a kid? Since we got mostly adults in here. When you really were looking to get something from mom or dad, And you came in, you'd butter them up a little bit, wouldn't you? And I'm not saying we're trying to butter God up. But in this recognition, it's a reminder to ourselves who you're talking to. Does that make sense to you? So I want to encourage you in your time of spending time with God to make yourself a little recognition list of who he is to you. Does that make sense? And then as you spend time with God, Thank him for being all of those things to you. Number, or in this example is recognition. Next, revelation. Watch this. Verse 9 said, reveal to us in the message. Reveal to us who you are. In your time, after you've recognized who you think he is, take some time and say, hey God, reveal to me. Show me. I want to know you better. I want and how many know this? Prayer doesn't need to always be talking. God gives us one mouth and two ears. I think it's very wise as human beings to use them in proportion. It works in human contact with people too. Try it out. <laughs> Seriously. You spend, next time you spend time with someone at lunch, try out that practice. Every time you open your mouth, kind of look at your watch and then shut your mouth for twice as long. Let the other person talk and you listen. How many know you can find out a lot of stuff when you listen? Listening is an important quality. And in this reveal yourself moments of God, that could be your listening time to God. Because he can't reveal himself while your mouth is moving. Because you'll only hear yourself. So recognition, revelation, restoration. Verse 10 said, set the world right. Set the world right. What's, hey, you know what? Thank God for what he did with Jesus Christ on the cross. But you know what? There's a lot of things in this world that still ain't right. And the way you learned it might be your kingdom come. 
In other words, we're saying, hey, God, we want to see what, what you got going on in heaven. We want to see it happening right here on earth. Restore this place to its own original purpose let us be restored as people restore our families restore our cities restore our country how many know what i'm saying restoration next his will you're praying for his will do what's best above and below so in other words if you've got something you've been thinking you want this is your time to run it by him and say hey god just like jesus did not my will but your will you're asking for god's will then in this example, he said, pray for your needs. Those should be the things you do know of. Rent, electricity bill, three square meals, like he said here. Sometimes our wants and our needs aren't the same, though. Is everybody tracking with me on that? Many times as human beings, our wants are a little bit out of, tra out of, out of, out of kilter. So make sure in this, you're keeping your needs on here. That's what Jesus was saying. Give us this day our daily bread. Keep us alive, it says in the message with three squares. Next, he says, forgiveness. Watch this. Keep us forgiven as we are forgiven others. It's pretty simple, but very profound. Sounds real easy, doesn't it? Anybody ever had a hard time forgiving others? I don't know what it is about us human beings. But man... We can come before God on Sunday morning with snots and tears, blown up, messed up, all kinds of sideways with God, believe him, touching our lives, it's wonderful, and walk out of this place. And people that have done less to us than we did, we're holding a grudge against them. He says, in our daily prayer, we should be asking for forgiveness and asking God to create in us a forgiving heart. We're not born with it, let's face it. Most of us don't like forgiving. It's a hard thing to do. It's not our natural nature that you just don't know. That's not how I am. I don't let people get over. I'm not saying we let people get over on us. But man, if you walk around with a forgiving nature, if you make this your prayer every day, if, if you make it your prayer every day that you say, God, help me to be a forgiver like you're a forgiver. I, can, I believe, how many think before this day's over, you have the chance to be offended and hold a grudge against somebody? You probably do. Someone's going to step on your toes. Someone's going to jack up your order at McDonald's or Cane's or, or Chuck Box. Someone's going to cut you off in traffic. How about this? How about every one of us decide right now, when I get cut off in traffic and that black truck runs up against the side of me like it's going to run me off the road, I'm just going to forgive that dude. I'm going to forgive him right now so that when we get on the road, I don't have to think about it twice. I just change lanes and go, okay, have some space, bro. It's cool. Oh, man, that is just not our nature, is it? It was hard to say that. I was saying it like in third person, like it wasn't really me. How many are hearing what I'm saying? Wanting forgiveness is the easy one, right? Giving forgiveness, on the other hand, even I'm talking about, really, though, that, that's a simple little thing, someone messing up your meal or someone cutting you off in traffic. I'm being pretty simple, pretty elementary. Some of us have some pretty deep forgiveness issues that we got to work through. And that's why it needs to be in your prayer every day. Hello? So recognition, revelation restoration his will our needs forgiveness protection keep us forgiving was verse 12 verse 13 said i love the way the message says this too don't don't say it in your own mind right now keep keep that memorized prayer out for a second the message says it this way protection keep us safe from ourselves can I pause right there the next one it says and from the devil from ourselves first let me just say this besides God who's with you every day all day all day long yourself I 
I would want to have you close your eyes and want to be embarrassed, but nobody raise hands, but just think as if you were going to raise your hands. Can the devil be with you and me in different parts of the city at the same time? He cannot. He is not omnipresent like God. Everybody hearing what I'm saying? He was one fallen angel. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Don't give him more power than he deserves. Listen to me here. And only one third of the angels fell with him. In other words, there's two thirds of the angels still serving God and still protecting you and I. Too often folks are saying the devil made me do it. Remember the old Flip Wilson thing? The devil didn't make you do it. You made you do it. You're just looking for a scapegoat. We need protection from ourself more than we need it from the enemy. Because we get ourselves in bad positions that puts us at the mercy of the enemy. Is everybody hearing what I'm saying? So in your protection, wait, besides God, because God knows how to look at you truthfully and honestly, there's probably not anybody knows your weaknesses better than you. If you're honest with yourself, right? And because we know our weaknesses, we know how to pray, protect us from ourselves. Are you hearing me? Awful quiet in here right now. It's, it's kind of like the dentist's office when you strike a nerve, you know, it's like. Argh. Protect us from ourselves and from the enemy. Not that there's, and let me say this. Not that there's not an enemy of your soul and my soul. Protect us from ourselves and from the enemy. Okay, so recognition, revelation, restoration, his will, our needs, forgiveness, protection, surrender. Verse 13 says this from the message, you are in charge. Sometimes we just need to make that statement after we've done all this reasoning with God, after we've done all this chit-chatting with God, after we've made all these um, requests with God. This is, this is what I'm thinking, God. These are what I thought were my needs. I'm praying for your will, but I don't know that I can always hear it. Nah, 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 nah. On and on. And we get to really rattling and we get to, get to talking stuff. Hello. And then, you, then it all starts sounding good. And then you begin mixing your will with God's scriptures. And you're going, okay, this has got to be the way it's all going to work out. It, but then at the end, you better just lay it all on the table and say, you're in charge. You're in charge. I'm not trying to manipulate this thing. You're in charge. Hands are open. No, fi no clinch fists with God. Hands are open. You're in charge. You want something in my hand? You can put it in there. Something's in my hand. You want taken out? Take it out, God. You're in charge. Then watch this. After surrender, these words I'm throwing out there, I came up with them as I was studying. Okay, they're my words. This isn't, I called this next one exclamation proclamation. I don't even know if that's, that's that. I'm sure the grammar on that is all blown sideways. So if you're an English major, please don't correct me after church, okay? Exclamation proclamation. He says, you can do anything. And what he's saying is, you're in charge, God. You can do anything. I'm confident you can do anything. There ain't anything you can't do. You can do it. In, in, in the message, that ended with an exclamation point. What's he doing? He's proclaiming. He's stating. He's saying it out loud. You can do anything, God. And in your prayer time, you need to remind yourself, there's nothing that I'm thinking, nothing I'm hoping, nothing that we need in this life. He can't do. He can do anything did he say anything 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 and do it and you need to you need remind yourself of it even if you have to get a little silly in your god you could do anything 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 anything, anything. uh-oh he can even shut the preacher up if he wants that's what that was Next point, I guess, right? <laughs> Anything. In this example, recognition, revelation, restoration, his will, our needs, forgiveness, protection, surrender, 
exclamation, proclamation. You can call that something different if that one's too long for you. I'm cool. You can change it. But that's just, that was the PJ-ness in that, okay? That was me. But you get the point. Next is worship. And folks, at Big House, I've always taught that worship is not a song. It's a lifestyle. It's the way you live your life. Romans 12 in the message says it's your everyday walking around, talking up and down, going to bed and getting up and going to work lifestyle. That needs to be your worship. But you know what? In this part of our prayer, there's. How about this one? That'll work. What's happening? And let's go to this one, all right? A little less monitor on this one, probably a little more house, I don't know. But I know you got me hot in the monitor. You can hear it? I feel like I'm in a box right there, bro. Okay, here we go. We're going from exclamation, proclamation. That, that, was, that was one of those microphones that runs on, it's not Bluetooth, but it's like the old school Bluetooth, so it's like, like frequencies of the air. Ephesians chapter 5 says that's who we battle against. So we're going to accord because we're all going to be in one accord, like it says in the book of Acts, right? <laughs> Exclamation, proclamation, worship. He says this in the message. He says, you're a blaze. A blaze in beauty. Yes, yes. What's he saying? He's saying, God, you're just stinking incredible. You're phenomenally freaking awesome. Supernaturally stupendous. It's a moment of worship. And if that moment of worship should turn into a moment of you expressing to God how incredible and wonderful and awesome you think he is. And then it reminds me of the word hallelujah. Okay. Hallelujah. Doesn't that sound like a churchy word? Come on, doesn't that word just sound churchy? Come on. Help me out over here. It sounds churchy. I mean, really, how many times have you heard me use the word preaching? You know why? It sounds churchy, doesn't it? Truthful matter is, though, it's a Hebrew word. It's not a churchy word. It's not an American church word. It's a Hebrew word. Now, in American church, you may find people that have been raised in religion. They go to very religious churches, and they'll walk around and say, hallelujah, brother, hallelujah, sister. You know, and, and <laughs> you've seen that before, didn't she? She didn't have to raise her hand. Yeah, I see. She just, the, the response was there. But the word itself is an awesome word. It's a Hebrew word. And the word itself literally means, and it could be hallelujah with the H-A-L-L, or it could be hallelujah, A-L-L, not A-W-A-Y, E-L-U-I-E. And it means praise the Lord. It literally means praise the Lord. Now, the, the phrase praise the Lord could be a little religious too. And we're just saying it to each other, praise the Lord, sister, praise the Lord, brother. Right? But if you're praising him, it's not religious. And although I teach that our worship, because it is important for your 24-hour day, walking around, talking, getting up and eating, going to bed and going to work and living and raising your family is a lifestyle of worship, your words are a worship as well to God. Many times David, the psalmist, he was, he was, he was like a, a goal, except for he was playing a harp, Right? He worshiped on, and he sang songs, and he said, and he would speak to his soul and tell his soul, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Probably because he was having a bad day. Have you ever had to tell yourself to do something you didn't want to do because you knew it was right to do it? This worship time, as, you end, as you're beginning to end your prayer time, is a time for you to just exclaim to God. And that might be a time that you turn on worship music. Hallelujah. And I, I just listened, been listening to a new song that is by one of my new favorite artists that I've known for a long time, known of him for a long time, but he's really become top on my list. 
Jeremy Camp's got a song where he, he sings hallelujah. And it means praise the Lord. It's a Hebrew word. And so it's not anybody else's word to praise God. It's the Hebrew word to praise the one and true and the only God. It's an exclamation of praise. Exclamation, proclamation. In exaltation, it's a lifting up. As you say that, what you're doing is you're, you're saying, God, this world's trying to push your name down. I'm lifting your name up. And it's important for us to have a time of worship in our intimate time with God. Is everybody tracking with me? And then in Matthew, unlike Luke, he goes back to forgiveness and he says this for if you forgive other people when they sin against you your heavenly father will forgive you but if you don't forgive others of their sins these are some harsh words of prayer why are they repeated at the end I believe this we prayed them in the middle Help us to be forgiving. Help us to be forgiven. But now we've spent all this time with God. The loving, incredible creator of the universe. How many know what I'm saying? Remember me saying and Jesus saying, as you spend that time with God, is God changing in your presence? Your perception of God could change. And he is jealous for me. He's changing you. He loves like a hurricane. And as you've taken that time to get a new revelation of him, to recognize how awesome and wonderful he is, the weight of his wind and mercy. As you've taken time to lift up that name of God with hallelujahs, I am on not religiously, but intimately. Eclipsed. By glory, some things and might come to your mind that you never cleared out. Beautiful out. you are, and how and great that's what your happens. affections are the presence for of God. me. And oh, he don't change. How His love he never changes. So. Hopefully, and oh, change. how he loves us. Let's do this place. And how. His holy presence is here just like that right now. His holy presence is here. So let's let him begin to reveal to us. Let's close our eyes for just a moment to be personal, intimate with him. Why don't we do this? Let's turn our faces towards heaven. That's who we're looking at. That's who we're looking for.